Hello and welcome back. Chapter 10, Reporting and Analyzing Liabilities. People, we are here. It is uh, the final week before break. Maybe you have some other tests or large deliverables or maybe you are sailing into having a week off or a week to catch up or however you look at it. People, I am excited. Uh, to be obviously if there's two peoples in one intro because look at this the hard work that you have earned we have two maybe like one and two thirds learning objectives so uh, pitter patter let's get at her this again chapter analyzing liabilities we've all heard that term <laughs> you know, that friend, or maybe we've all had that friend, maybe we are that friend uh, who is a liability. So what does that mean? What are we like really saying when we're saying, oh man, they are such a liability? We're basically saying you gotta watch out for them because they're gonna cost us something. They're gonna cost us time, money, energy, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, some trouble. So let's look at this in a financial context, which honestly, isn't that much different from that friend? I think of this as past, present, future. This definition will come up about 50 times if you take my IFA2 class, uh, that's mm, 3111, uh, fall of your final and fourth year if you're an accounting major or <laughs> just wanna do some extra accounting. Okay, past, present, future. A liability must meet all three criteria. Uh, it must be representative of a past transaction that represents a present obligation uh, to transfer economic resources that you can't get out of that will result in the future outflow of economic resources. We classify uh, liabilities that will become due in less than one year as current, and if they're a year or longer, non-current. All right, last nuance here. Liabilities can be financial or non-financial. If you think financial, think cash. Financial liabilities require cash settlements. Non-financial liabilities, everything else, non-cash settlement. Uh, so most liabilities are gonna be financial liabilities. You know, like if we go pick up some supplies and we're like, hey, put that on account, they're gonna record uh, the sale, the revenue, they're gonna say debit accounts receivable, credit revenue, you're going to debit your supplies, you're gonna credit your accounts payable, and then when you settle up within the terms stated, you are going to debit your accounts payable and credit cash, so that's a financial liability. However, we do have liabilities that are non-cash, and one of those would be deferred revenues. Remember when we talked about Shania Twain or Taylor Swift, how they <laughs> sell those, you know, moderately priced <clears throat> uh, <laughs> tickets for amazing venues they've absolutely earned. Uh, and like, anyways, I, I have a lot to say about, um, you know, people earning, um, you know, putting in some hard work and some hustle for like, you know, 20 years, and um, I think it really is cool to see the ceiling lift so high. So uh, that said, I don't personally value <laughs> um, like that. That's just a lot. Um, and, and concerts have a lot of people, and they get really close. Anyway, so Taylor Swift uh, collects a bunch of money, her and her team, uh, because she has an awesome tour, I've heard. And um, But they collect the money, debit cash, credit deferred revenues. They can't recognize it as revenue until she does the uh, concert. Once she does the concert, uh, debit deferred revenue to wipe out that liability and credit revenue. So you're just kind of holding on to the money until you actually give the concert. Or uh, say something were to happen where she, cause I know she just recently announced Vancouver. So she sells all the tickets and then, um, I don't know, say she just can't get into Canada, um, you know, next year sometime. Uh, then they would deb debit deferred revenue and credit cash to give all the cash back. So we have it as a liability because it's a result of a past transaction, somebody paid the tickets, that's gonna result in a um, present obligation uh, that you know, Shania, uh, that Shania or Taylor can't get out of, which got to deliver that concert to give back that cash, and that will result in the future outflow of economic resources. She got to put on that concert. 
So because we're expecting a concert and not a return of money, that's why it's a non-financial uh, liability. We want the concert. The money is fine if we don't get the concert, but we want the concert. Okay, there's gonna be a list next. There are lots of other types of liabilities, just like our friends can do a lot of different things to make trouble for us on an evening out on the town. Uh, we got a lot of liabilities. Okay, so we're gonna focus on the current liabilities here. We have bank indebtedness from operating lines of credit. So these typically offset our cash account. Um, they're to make sure we don't bounce any checks um, just in case some of our suppliers are uh, are slow to pay us, or pardon me, um, we're fast to pay our suppliers, but slow to collect on our receivables. We could have accounts payable. Uh, we could have accrued liabilities like salaries or interest and income tax. Uh, we could owe somebody a refund. And you know, maybe we move it from deferred revenue uh, to refund liabilities, and then the moment we cut the checks on the Friday, then we have the refund liabilities that we can reverse out and credit the cash from there. Uh, deferred revenues, which we already spoke about, notes payable, which is just the flip side of note receivables, as well as if we have a long-term liability that is, uh, say, a really big loan, a mortgage or something, we also have to reflect the current portion, meaning the portion that we will need to pay within the next 12 months uh, on our uh, statement of financial position as a current liability. All right, let's talk more about the first one. Operating line of credit. So these are pre-arranged between a company and a lender. And this allows the company to kind of borrow up to or have a buffer of an agreed upon amount. And this really isn't to finance long-term, like big assets or even, um, you know, like pay employees. It's here to manage temporary cash shortfalls. So timing issues. The interest is usually um, floating, variable, uh, and it's just to really allow the company to not incur any um, like bounced, quote, bounced checks or like, um, you know, send an EFT and not be able to have it go through. It would really just be unfortunate. Uh, oftentimes, these um, operating lines of credit are secured, meaning uh, the collateral is required by the bank. It might be secured based on a percentage of your accounts receivable and inventory. Uh, it might be secured by a personal guarantee um, or possibly maybe the bank is like, listen, you're Canadian Tire, you get a couple hundred million dollars just for being Canadian Tire. Okay, so again, uh, this is the flip side of cash. Um, and if you ever see that your cash is in a credit balance or, you know, quote, a negative debit, then you would just rename it on your financial statements as an operating line of credit. It literally just floats back and forth. Think of it as actually kind of like one T account. Um, and if it's a debit balance, we call it cash. And if it's a credit balance, we'll call it, um, you know, operating line of credit. Uh, sometimes <sighs> accounts won't be linked depending on the company. Sometimes they'll have cash and then they'll have a separate line of credit or operating line of credit. And that's fine, weird. Fine, um, companies are allowed to set up their books however they like, um, and I'm just telling you both of them so that when you are out there in the real world, you know, you, you kind of understand the relationship between cash and this operating line of credit. All right, so um, I also wanted to just kind of let you know about sales tax. So these are things that we saw in a previous chapter. Um, we have our federal goods and services tax. These are also called indirect taxes, by the way. And we also have provincial or harmonized sales tax, just depending on where in the country you are living. Um, so when we have these, uh, you know, you collect all the cash, say the 11300 but you would only book $10,000 for the actual sale. And then, yes, ouch, $1,300 um, for the sales tax uh, payable. So it is a flow through tax, meaning you would remit all of these sales taxes that you collected uh, net of whatever you paid. So if you bought inventory, if you bought PP&E, you would have presumably paid uh, HST or uh, PST or GST or a combination of those. And so at the end of the quarter or end of the year, you remit whatever the net is. So 
If you collected $1,300 but paid $300, you would owe them $1,000 and cut the check for that. All right, so I have a question for you. What are some examples of current liabilities a small retail clothing store located in a shopping mall? By the way, I don't know if located in the shopping mall really matters here, but I wrote it, so we'll go with it. Uh, what kind of liabilities do you think that this small retail clothing store may have? Please give this video a pause and come back in just a moment. All right, welcome back. Uh, those astute listeners we know that I never paused anything there. Okay, sometimes I do. Okay, I want to just advise you that answers may vary and that is okay. We have long list of liabilities. Remember, just like we have uh, different people that can be a liability, we have lots of different types of uh, these financial and non-financial liabilities. Okay, um, so recency bias, they might have an operating line of credit. They're a small business. Um, people might not pay them and they might still need to pay their bills. Uh, so that, some sales taxes, some salaries, some wages payable, uh, or and maybe some accounts payable or accrued interest. So effectively, we're just going back here and we're applying them and we're saying, okay, that makes sense. Now, hmm, we probably don't have any refund liabilities. We probably don't have any deferred revenue because people aren't like paying us money and then just like leaving their clothes there. Um, don't think that happens. Um, people, I, <laughs> I'm a bad shopper. Um, I like, if I find something and I like it, I buy it in three different colors or two different colors or, you know, and I, I tend to have a color scheme that I try to go for. Um, and I like certain brands, not necessarily because I'm like, ooh, brands, but because then they have the same sizes for everything. And then you can buy stuff on the internet and you can return things on the internet and and malls are busy, you know? And so this is like a pre-COVID thing. And uh, I'm still, I don't know, maybe one day. That said, I did get a really lovely jacket from RW & Co. Um, a while back that I really, made me preliminarily rethink my thought about not going to malls. Um, but anyways, here we are. Um, okay, I'm happy with that. Let's talk about another type of liabilities. And this is a bit of a wonky one because um, I'll just, I'll show you. It's an uncertain liability. So effectively, this is when we're like, well, to whom is an obligation owed? Well, when is the obligation gonna have to be settled? What kind of amount is gonna need to be settled? Um, so this would be something like if you backed into um, like a building with your company's SUV and you're like, oh crap, is there damage? Are they gonna sue me? Um, but what happened? How much are they gonna sue me for? Are they, maybe I can just pay them in cash or is there really, like, is there even any damage? Does anything happen? Like I, I don't really think anything's there. You know, a customer slips and falls um, <laughs> and, and is trying to sue you. They have like an outstanding thing for, $20,000. Um, then you play back the video and you realize that the customer spilled the water on the floor and, you know, made a, you know, basically jumped into the air and like flopped down on the floor. Well, they're suing you. Uh, is it probable that you're going to have to pay that because you have the video? Is it, you know, likely to go on for a while? Maybe you just want to pay them the 20000 because the lawyer fees will be more than that. Hi, people. These are uncertain liabilities. Something happened in the past that represents a um, future or a present obligation that you're unlikely to get out of, and it's gonna have a future outflow of economic resources. Okay, if you were listening closely, that went in the middle. A present obligation for a future outflow of economic resources. Um, so present obligation that you're unlikely to get out of. That is the criteria that we are going to argue with here. That is our gray area, and that is our professional judgment that will come in. And so if you're under IFRS, probable, probably can't get out of it, is the professional judgment about 50%. It's more likely than not going to happen. If it's more likely than not going to happen, then we say that that kind of present obligation we can't get out of has been met. Aspie. Our private company people, oh, look at this. Look at my, that's me. I'm sorry. This should be a little um, quotes. Okay, whatever. 
um, likely an ASPE, our private company one, is instead of probable, they want likely. So that's basically a high level of certainty, typically 90% or more. So under our slip and fall, probable, I don't know, like if that customer has like a really good lawyer and you're like, oh, I don't know, maybe it's just easier to just, just settle up and you're just thinking about it, you're probably, probable, uh, gonna book the uncertain liability. However, if you are Walmart and you have a, I don't know, like a, a wicked awesome legal team, I assume they have a wicked awesome legal team, they're big, um, and I'm sure people slip and fall there all the time and we don't hear about it very often, um, then if you're Walmart, I'd be like, why are you using ASPE, but whatever. Um, and, or I guess, let's skip it with I for us. They're probably not gonna pay, so they probably wouldn't um, record this liability because remember, all three, past, present, future, have to um, be satisfied in order to book it, and the present one is the one that we're arguing with here. All right, and then under ASPE, likely is it has to be more than 90%. Well, even if you are the small mom and pop, maybe you are the people from the small retail clothing store located in a shopping mall, uh, and you're recording under ASPE, and you have the video recording, maybe you just send the recording to the customer who, who quote, slipped, you CC your lawyer, and you're like, yeah, we're not gonna pay you because we have this video, and it's likely that the customer might just go away after that. Who knows? So, um, because it's a greater threshold for recording it under ASPE, you just really have to know the differences between ASPE and IFRS and when uh, those two and how those two are applied. Okay, so let's test yourself. Uh, liabilities, okay, I'm not gonna read this out and we'll just pause this, answer these, and I'll come back. Oh, by the way, uh, there's gonna be some multiple choice on your final exam, uh, multiple choice in your next mini test, so let's let's practice a few here. Okay, give this pause, come back, and we'll talk. All right, so if you said D, all of the above, you are correct. Liabilities are a creditor's claim on total assets, uh, existing debts and obligations, and obligations that must be paid or settled at some time in the future by some sort of assets or services. Absolutely correct. Number two, if you said both A and B, again, you are correct. Notes payable are, have, are often supported with written documentation and come with interest income. All right, round number two. Give this pause and we will talk soon. Oh, by the way, last slide, just in case that makes us any uh, funner. Oh, and that's Bambi. She's scratching. Sorry again. Okay, talk soon. <laughs> All right, Bambi got uh, a little bit uh, self-conscious. She stopped scratching. Um, sorry, girl. Um, number three, if you said B, you are correct. So we would take that 13% times it by um, 850, and then we would get our $110,500. That is how much, um, yeah, uh, of the sale that would then be charged on top of it. So they'd end up collecting over, gosh, 960,500 people. I bought a car out here, and I, I was like, I, I just remember calculating in my head what the HST, the 15% was gonna be. And anyways, I'm just, again, first world problems to be able to, to purchase a vehicle. Um, it was not new. It was new to me and I love, love it. It was my 10-year uh, vehicle. But I, I worked backwards because I knew I didn't want to pay more than, you know, X amount. And I remember working backwards to make sure that when I had the final amount times the 1.15, that it was under that amount. Because yeah, I couldn't imagine having $110,500 in HST. But anyways, uh, number seven, or sorry, number four, number seven, people, I'm sorry. Uh, secured notes. Uh, the correct answer here is A. You have special assets of the issuer that's pledged as collateral. The whole secured thing, that means security, that means that whoever is lending you the money um, needs something in case you're gonna default. They don't want to take the security, they want you to pay the money and the interest, but if you're not gonna pay, they wanna make sure that they have something, or at least something to hold as leverage until you pay them their money. 
All right. Uh, thank you so much. That's it for this learning objective. I will see you in the next one.